Chicago. Chicago is one of the most famous American cities. Some cities in the United States, such as New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, may be more glamorous. But many people agree that Chicago is the city that best represents the United States. Located in the middle of North America, Chicago has derived much benefit from its geography. The city's central location has made its O'Hare International Airport the hub for most airlines in the United States. Its location on the shores of Lake Michigan has made it a major port and business center, where the agricultural and industrial products of the American Midwest are shipped overseas. Until about the 1830s, Chicago was a minor trading post. But then it grew rapidly as the most important town in the rapidly developing areas of the Midwestern United States. In 1871, the city was destroyed by a fire. It is often said that the fire started when a cow knocked over an oil lamp. It took about 20 years for the city to be completely rebuilt, but it continued to expand. In 1882, the first skyscraper was built in Chicago. Around the turn of the century, the population of Chicago was growing quickly. Many African American people moved to Chicago from the southern United States, and many immigrants from Eastern Europe also arrived in Chicago during this time. Because of the busy and active atmosphere of the city, an American poet described Chicago as. The city of broad shoulders. Chicago became notorious for organized crime during the Prohibition era of the 1920s, when the sale of alcohol was illegal. Mobsters such as Al Capone became rich by smuggling liquor, and many people were killed in conflicts between rival gangs of criminals. But the influence of organized crime. Later became weaker. In the decades following World War II, Chicago experienced some problems with crime, poverty, and racial conflict. However, the city has recently prospered, and social conditions have improved for many people in Chicago. Compared with other large cities, Chicago is viewed as an affordable place to live with a high quality of life. The city has efficient transportation and many beautiful parks along the Lake Michigan shoreline. Chicago is famous for its many attractions, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Field Museum of Natural History, the Shedd Aquarium, the Sears Tower, and the Miracle Mile Shopping District. Indeed, Chicago is one of the most interesting cities in the United States. Women and the right to vote. In most countries today, people think it is obvious that all adults should have the right to vote in democratic elections. But it was not so long ago that women did not have this right. Only after a long struggle did women gain the right to vote. By the early 19th century, modern democratic forms of government were appearing in the United States, Great Britain, and some European countries. In these countries, most adult men had the right to vote in democratic elections. Some men were denied this right if they were poor or if they belonged to a racial minority group. But gradually, this right was extended to all men. It took much longer for women to gain the right to vote. Only in special cases, such as that of a widow who owned land, could a woman be allowed to vote. Many men believed that it was not necessary for women to vote, because they assumed that the husband should decide on behalf of his wife. Some men believed that women did not possess the intelligence or the discipline to vote carefully. Some women also believed that women should not be involved in politics, but many others wanted the right to vote. By about the year 
some women began to organize in an effort to change the laws regarding women and the vote. This movement was known as the woman suffrage movement because the word suffrage means voting. Leaders such as Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton brought attention to this issue and persuaded many people that women should vote. The first part of the United States to recognize women's right to vote was Wyoming in the year 1869. During the following decades, many other states recognized women's right to vote, particularly in the western part of the country where women had a high social status. However, the United States was not the first country to recognize women's right to vote at the national level. The first country to recognize women's right to vote was New Zealand in 1893. Soon after, Australia also allowed women to vote, and so did the Scandinavian countries of Northern Europe. But in countries such as the United States, Canada, and Great Britain, women could not yet vote. Women in those countries struggled to gain the vote. For example, in Great Britain, Emmeline Pankhurst and her daughters participated in hunger strikes. During World War I, 1914-1918, women's work efforts were very important to winning the war, and people's attitudes were increasingly in favor of women having the right to vote. Women then gained the right to vote in Canada, the United States, and Great Britain. Gradually, other democracies around the world also recognize women's right to vote. Today, it seems difficult to believe that women were not allowed to vote only a few generations ago. But there is still progress to be made. In most countries, women are underrepresented among political leaders. Perhaps the day will soon come when women are elected as often as men. Charles Dickens Charles Dickens is considered one of the greatest writers in the history of English literature. Dickens wrote his many novels during the 19th century, but those novels remain popular even today. Literary experts admire his genius at describing the lives and personalities of the many characters in his books. Charles Dickens was born in England in 1812. His father was a clerk who worked for the Navy. Unfortunately, his father was not good at managing money, and the family soon went deeply into debt. In those days, people who owed money were sent to prison, and their families were sent to places called workhouses. When Charles's father was unable to pay the debts, Charles was sent to a workhouse, where he had to work long hours, and Charles' father was sent to prison. After a few years, the family regained its freedom, but the experience had a lasting effect upon Charles. As a young man, Charles Dickens worked as a journalist in the law courts and in Parliament, but he soon began writing stories for newspapers. These stories were very popular with the readers. Soon Dickens began writing entire novels for the newspapers. Each month, the newspaper would publish another chapter of Dickens' latest novel. One of Dickens' most famous early novels is called Oliver Twist. This is the story of a young man who is poor and alone in the city of London and becomes involved in criminal activities to support himself. The characters in this novel have a very wide range of personalities, but seem very real to the reader. The book exposed the conditions that face the poor people of London and helped to encourage reforms aimed at improving those conditions. Perhaps Dickens' most popular novel is A Christmas Carol. 
In this story, a rich but stingy old man, Ebenezer Scrooge, refuses to give his employee a day off at Christmas and refuses to donate money to help the poor. But while sleeping, Scrooge is visited by ghosts from his past, present, and future. These ghosts show Scrooge how badly he has behaved. When Scrooge wakes up, he becomes a kind and generous man who fully appreciates the spirit of the Christmas holiday. Another famous novel of Dickens is A Tale of Two Cities. This is a story of the violence and upheaval during the French Revolution. The story is famous for the heroic act of sacrifice that is made by one character for the benefit of the others. Dickens was famous as a public speaker, and large crowds assembled to hear his performances. When he died in 1870, he was a very famous man. The novels of Charles Dickens allow the reader to experience the life of 19th century London, showing the poverty and injustice that were so common. The characters of these novels show the range of human behavior, from cruelty and selfishness to kindness and love. It is no surprise that Dickens is viewed as one of the great figures of English literature. Samuel Clemens or Mark Twain Mark Twain was the author of some of the greatest works of American English literature, such as Tom Sawyer, Life on the Mississippi, and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Mark Twain's real name was Samuel Langhorn Clemens. He used Mark Twain as his pen name. Samuel Clemens was born in the American state of Missouri in 1835. As a child, he enjoyed many outdoor activities, such as swimming and fishing. When Samuel was 11 years old, his father died, and he began working to help support his family. As a young man, Samuel Clemens began to write stories for newspapers. However, he took a job working as a navigator on the steamboats that traveled up and down the Mississippi River. Clemens greatly enjoyed this period of his life, during which time he gained much knowledge about life on the river. He also learned much about human behavior by observing the many people on the boats and along the river. It was as a result of this time that Clemens began using his pen name, Mark Twain. This name is taken from a term that was used by the men who worked on the river. It is used to describe water that is just deep enough to be navigated safely. The earliest of Mark Twain's really famous novels was The Adventures of Tom Sawyer. This novel describes a boy who engages in much mischief, but who has a kind heart. The story contains several scenes that are quite funny. In one of these, Tom's working at the boring task of painting a fence. He persuades several other boys to help him by pretending that painting the fence is a fun and enjoyable activity. Another famous novel by Mark Twain was Life on the Mississippi. This book describes many interesting characters similar to those that Twain actually observed while working on a steamboat. This story gives the reader a vivid image of the people who lived and worked along the Mississippi River. Probably the best novel by Mark Twain was The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This novel tells the story of a boy who runs away from his violent father. The boy, whose name is Huckleberry Finn, is joined in his escape by a man named Jim. Jim is a slave who has decided to run away from his owners. Huck and Jim travel north along the Mississippi, hoping to reach the areas where slavery is not allowed. In this story, the reader can experience the moral sense of Huckleberry, who must make several important decisions during the escape.
Mark Twain died in 1910 after writing many more novels and many stories of his travels around the world. Twain's works are still widely read today. His books are appreciated for their humor, for their interesting descriptions of life in 19th century America, and for showing both the good and evil that people can do. Many critics consider Twain to have been the greatest American writer. The Islands of the Caribbean The Caribbean Sea is the large body of water that lies north of the northern tip of South America. Within the Caribbean Sea are many islands that have played an important role in the history and culture of the Western Hemisphere. By far the largest island in the Caribbean is Cuba. Cuba was formerly a colony of Spain, but became independent in 1902. Cuba became a communist country in 1959, when a revolution overthrew an unpopular government. After the revolution, many Cubans fled to the United States. Today, the American city of Miami, in the state of Florida, has been greatly influenced by Cuban culture. Tobacco is widely grown in Cuba, and the country is famous for the cigars that are produced in the capital city, Havana. The island of Hispaniola is located just east of Cuba. This island is divided into two countries. In the west is Haiti, where the people speak a variety of the French language that has been influenced by African languages. In the east is the Dominican Republic, where the people speak Spanish. Another important Caribbean island is Puerto Rico. This was previously a Spanish colony, but is now governed by the United States. Many people from Puerto Rico have moved to the mainland United States, especially the New York area. In many other islands in the Caribbean, English is the main language. The largest of these islands is Jamaica, which is located just south of Cuba. Most Jamaicans are the descendants of African people who were brought to work as slaves on sugar plantations. Jamaica is famous as the birthplace of the style of music called reggae, which was popularized in other countries by Bob Marley, a famous Jamaican musician. Another important English-speaking Caribbean island is Trinidad. This island is located just north of South America. The population of Trinidad is very diverse. The largest groups of people are descended from people who came from Africa and India, but there are many other nationalities also. Trinidad is famous for a style of music known as Calypso and for musicians who produce pleasant sounds by playing steel drums. There are also many other smaller islands in the Caribbean, each with its own unique features. Many of these islands possess fine beaches and are popular tourist destinations. The warm weather of the Caribbean makes it a popular place for North Americans who must live through cold winters. North American Indians The first people who lived in North America were the Indians. The name Indians is actually not very accurate because the people are not from India. But when the first Europeans came to North America, they mistakenly believed that they had reached India, so they referred to the people as Indians. In different parts of North America, the Indians had very different cultures and very different ways of making a living. On the west coast of North America, many large rivers flow into the Pacific Ocean. In these rivers is an abundance of fish, such as salmon. The Indians in these areas obtained much of their food by fishing. They lived in settled villages and became experts in carving wood from the tall trees of the area. They carved large canoes for traveling on the rivers and oceans, and they also carved tall totem poles. 
totem poles were carvings of various animal or human figures, and often the poles had a mythical or spiritual significance for the people who carved them. Many beautiful totem poles can be seen in cities such as Vancouver or Victoria, in the Canadian state of British Columbia, or Seattle in the American state of Washington. The Plains Indians lived in the central prairie of North America. The various nations of the Plains lived by hunting large animals called buffalo or bison. Horses were brought to North America in the 16th century by the Spanish. The Indians who lived in the prairie areas had learned to become experts at riding horses, and on horseback they could hunt the giant herds of bison. They followed the buffalo from place to place. The Plains Indians lived in portable houses called teepees, which were made by sewing together buffalo skins and holding them in place with wooden poles. In the southwestern United States, some Indians lived by farming. In this dry area, the Indians raised several crops, such as corns, beans, and squash. Many of the Indians in these areas lived in large settlements where the houses were made from stone or dried mud. The people were experts at weaving, and they made clothing and blankets that had beautiful artistic designs. Near the eastern coast of North America, many Indians lived by a combination of farming and hunting. These people lived in fortified villages, some of which were inhabited for many years at a time. In some places, they built large earthworks that can still be seen today. In the forests of northern Canada, the Indians lived primarily by hunting, fishing, and gathering. Like the Indians of the prairie regions, they often moved from place to place in search of game animals to hunt. Today, the Indians of North America no longer live in their traditional ways. However, several Indian languages are still spoken by many thousands of people. Also, many Indians in the United States and Canada are very interested in maintaining the cultural traditions of their ancestors. How the First World War Started During the summer of 1914, many people in Europe felt very optimistic about the future. Modern technology was improving people's lives. Political freedom was gradually increasing in many countries. New artistic styles and scientific discoveries were being made. But later that summer, a terrible war began. In the early 20th century, the various countries of Europe competed with each other in an attempt to be the most powerful country on the continent. In each country, many of the political leaders wanted to control more land, more people, and more resources. The First World War began when the Archduke of Austria-Hungary was assassinated. Austria-Hungary wanted to punish the assassin, who was from the small country of Serbia. This led to a serious dispute, and soon other countries were involved. Within a few weeks, a war had begun. On one side were Germany and Austria-Hungary, and on the other side were Russia, France, and Britain. The people in these countries at first welcomed the news of a war. Many people were intensely patriotic and supported the war effort without thinking carefully about the reasons for the war. Some people thought that war would bring adventure and glory to their lives, and they cheered enthusiastically in the streets. After the war started, it soon became clear that it was a terrible disaster. In the western part of Europe, the opposing sides fought many bloody battles. Soldiers on both sides lived in filthy trenches that had been dug out of the ground. Sometimes hundreds of thousands of men were killed in battles that lasted only a few days. In most cases, these battles did not result in large gains or losses of territory. The war continued for more than four years. When the war was finally over, millions of people had been killed. 
Many people realized that their eagerness to fight against other countries had led them into a great disaster. This disaster did not end when the war ended in 1918. During the next 30 years, there would be many violent revolutions in Europe, and a second major war that would be even worse than the first. Today, people in most European countries no longer view other nations as enemies. They have no interest in fighting wars with their neighbors. Instead, they're interested in trading with the other countries and in visiting those countries as tourists. The lessons of the 20th century have reminded people that wars can have terrible consequences. Abraham Lincoln. When historians are asked to choose the greatest presidents in the history of the United States, one of the names most frequently mentioned is Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln was president during the greatest ordeal that ever faced the United States: the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln was born in 1809 in the state of Kentucky, but when he was a child, the family moved to the state of Indiana. Abraham's parents, Thomas and Nancy Lincoln, were farmers who were very poor, and they received only a few years of education. When Abraham was only nine years old, his mother became ill and died. About one year later, Abraham's father remarried. As a young man, Abraham continued to work on the family farm, and he also worked as a laborer. During this time, the Lincolns moved to the state of Illinois. Abraham became known to the local people as an excellent athlete and storyteller. He educated himself by reading many books, most of which he borrowed from neighbors. Lincoln was interested in politics, and when he was in his mid twenties, he was elected to the Illinois state legislature. During that time, Lincoln also studied law, and soon became known as an excellent lawyer. People called Lincoln "Honest Abe" because of his personal integrity. In 1842, Lincoln married a woman named Mary Todd. During the 1850s, Lincoln became strongly opposed to the expansion of slavery into the western parts of the United States. Lincoln held several famous debates against a supporter of slavery named Stephen Douglas. In 1860, Lincoln was a candidate in the election for president of the United States. During this election, the issue of slavery and its expansion was very prominent. Lincoln won, but soon after, several of the southern states decided to secede from the United States and form their own country. A few months later, fighting started between those southern states and the federal government, which was supported by the northern states. Lincoln managed the Civil War with skill and determination. Gradually, the North began to win the war. In 1863, Lincoln made the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves. Later that year, Lincoln gave his most famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. The Civil War had brought terrible suffering to many Americans, and people were very bitter after the war. But Lincoln wanted the country to become united again, and he urged people to forgive. However, in April of 1865, only months after the war ended, Lincoln was shot and killed by an assassin. Many people, even Lincoln's critics, mourned his death. In the generations that have passed since Lincoln's death, he has continued to be viewed as a great president. Some historians have criticized Lincoln for not being more strongly opposed to slavery, but others have defended him, saying that Lincoln's approach to the issue was realistic and humane. But nearly all historians agree that Lincoln was an honest and brave leader. During the most difficult period in American history, two great musicians, Mozart and Beethoven. 
Much of the music of 18th and 19th century Europe is still enjoyed by many people. Two of the greatest musicians of that time were born only 34 years apart. And actually knew each other for a short time. These great musicians were Mozart and Beethoven. Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart was born in Austria in the year 1756. As a child, Mozart was a music prodigy. He began composing music before his fifth birthday. And by the time he reached his teenage years, Mozart had already written many symphonies and other musical works. As a young man, Mozart worked as a concertmaster for the Archbishop of Salzburg in Austria. He also traveled to various European cities. When he was in his mid twenties, Mozart moved to the city of Vienna. Mozart had difficulty earning a living, but during this time he wrote some excellent operas and string quartets. Many people did not yet appreciate the greatness of Mozart's music. In his early thirties, Mozart became the court musician for the Emperor of Austria, and during the next few years, Mozart continued to write many beautiful works of music. Mozart died in 1791, but although his life was short, his productivity had been enormous. The beauty, grace, and technical precision of his music is still greatly admired, and he is considered one of the greatest musicians of all time. When Mozart was in Vienna, he met a young musician named Ludwig van Beethoven. Beethoven performed some music for Mozart, who was greatly impressed by the talent of this young man. Beethoven had been born in Germany in 1770, and from an early age, he had displayed a great aptitude for music. Beethoven moved permanently to Vienna in 1792. He studied music under some famous composers and became known for his outstanding skill. In playing the piano, Beethoven began to compose more of his own music, and these works became very popular. When in his late twenties, Beethoven began to lose his hearing. He continued to compose excellent music, but he became more withdrawn and performed less frequently. By the year 1817, Beethoven had become completely deaf, and he could no longer perform music. However, his creative genius did not deteriorate. Instead, Beethoven created many of his greatest works despite his deafness. It was Beethoven's influence that began the Romantic era of music, which followed the classical era of the 19th century. Beethoven died in 1827, but his music remains famous for its beauty and originality. His greatest symphonies, such as the Fifth Symphony, are among the world's best-known works of music. Today, the works of Mozart and Beethoven are still popular among those who appreciate great music. Music fans can look back with wonder at the musical creativity that flourished in Vienna more than two centuries ago. Amelia Earhart. Amelia Earhart was one of the most famous airplane pilots of all time. She is famous for the impressive travels that she made in her airplane, for the mystery surrounding her death, and for showing that women could perform great feats of aviation. Amelia Earhart was born in the American state of Kansas in the year 1897. After graduating from high school, Earhart decided to become a nurse. She worked as a military nurse in Canada during World War I, treating injured soldiers. After the war, she returned to the United States and became a social worker. But in 1920, she saw airplanes in a stunt flying exhibition, and early the next year, she took her first ride in an airplane. It was then that Amelia Earhart decided to become a pilot.
Within a few months, Earhart saved her money and bought a small airplane. She flew frequently and improved her skills as a pilot. In 1928, she joined two men in a flight across the Atlantic Ocean. But Amelia Earhart's greatest exploits were still to come. In May 1932, she attempted to become the first woman to fly solo or alone across the Atlantic Ocean. She flew east from the island of Newfoundland and faced cold weather, high winds, and dense fog. But she successfully crossed the ocean and landed her airplane in a farmer's field in Ireland. When news of her flight reached the United States, Amelia Earhart had become very famous. Later flights by Amelia Earhart were equally impressive. She became the first person to fly from Hawaii to California, across four thousand kilometers of Pacific Ocean. She also became the first person to fly from Mexico City to the New York City area, but in 1937 she planned her most ambitious flight—a journey around the world. On June 1st, 1937, Amelia Earhart took off from Miami, Florida. She was accompanied by her navigator Fred Noonan. They flew east, making stops along the way. Within one month, they had flown across three quarters of the globe, reaching the Pacific island of New Guinea. On July second, Earhart and Noonan took off from New Guinea, flying toward Howland Island. This very small island was over four thousand kilometers from New Guinea and was very difficult to find in the middle of the vast ocean. During this flight, Earhart and Noonan were in radio contact with some ships from the U.S. Navy. However, bad weather made it impossible to see the stars at night, so navigation was very difficult, and the plane became lost. Earhart and Noonan never arrived at Howland Island. The U.S. Navy undertook a massive search, but they never found the lost airplane. Earhart and Noonan. Had been lost at sea. Amelia Earhart's death was a great tragedy, but she had lived an exciting life that was full of achievements. She had helped to show that very long flights could be made and that women could perform feats of flying that were equal to those of men. Even today, many people are inspired by the courage and endurance of Amelia Earhart. Life in academia. A person like me, who teaches and conducts research at an academic institution, is called academic. The academic institution may be a form of a university, a college, or another post-secondary institution. I have been working in universities for almost eleven years. While enjoying my life in academia, we academics also have a lot of stress and often go through a large amount of stress and frustration. Firstly, we have pressure from the university we are working at to become effective teachers. As the environment, in terms of the society and the marketplace, has become more dynamic and competitive, we as teachers must provide students with necessary skills and knowledge so they can become successful in their society. It requires a lot of preparation. Updating of material, self-learning, and continuous improvement in teaching. For these reasons, teaching and learning should complement each other. Secondly, we have pressure from both our university and our academic peers to become active and effective researchers. What we teach to our students in class is no doubt closely related to what we have learned or discovered from our research activities. Thirdly, we have pressure from the university and the community to become good corporate citizens through active participation in various university committees and/or the community at large. 
A university and the community it belongs to must work closely together to identify common interests and to conduct projects that could benefit both parties. Even with a high degree of the aforementioned pressures, I love my job as a teacher, scholar, and citizen. There is a high level of freedom and flexibility. Academia is a place to meet new people, to create new ideas, and for everyone in that community to learn. It is a place where both teaching and learning always take place. Education systems in Canada. In Canada, each province is responsible for its own education systems. In general, there are three levels of education systems in Canada: one, kindergarten to grade eight; two, grade nine to grade twelve; three, post-secondary education. Kindergarten may further be divided into junior and senior kindergarten for four and five-year-old children, respectively. Grades nine to twelve students are enrolled in a secondary school system, which is similar to a high school system in the USA. Some cities and towns may have a junior high school system, which accommodates children from grade seven to grade nine. In the province of Ontario, there is grade thirteen, which is a required step for all students who want to attend a degree-granting university. This feature has been unique for Ontario, but the province has decided to abolish it in order to be consistent with other provinces' secondary education systems. By year two thousand and three, when grade thirteen is completely abandoned, the number of students entering a university or college is expected to be almost doubled, called double cohort. Post-secondary education system in Canada includes universities, community colleges, university colleges, and other private institutions providing post-secondary education, such as skill training and continuing education. A university is a standing-alone, degree-granting institution that offers certificates, diplomas, and bachelor, master, PhD degrees. There are about 50 universities throughout the country, most of which are publicly funded institutions. Some of the most recognized universities include the University of Toronto, McGill University, the University of British Columbia, and Queen's University. A community college offers a variety of programs for students who want to learn technical skills, skills that they can apply to the real world quickly. These programs are usually one or two years in length, emphasizing hands-on experience in a classroom setting. It grants certificates and diplomas, and offers a variety of training courses for people who want to upgrade themselves with the current markets and new technologies. A university college, as the name implies, is somewhat in between a community college and a university. This type of institution is common in British Columbia, the most western province in Canada. It grants certificates and diplomas by itself. However, it is not able to grant university degrees alone, although it often offers all the courses required for a university degree. The curriculum for a degree program is usually designed in conjunction with the university, which actually grants degrees to the university college students. Business education. What is business? A business includes all the activities involved to create and sell a product or service. The most important functional areas of business include accounting, finance. Marketing, production, operations, and human resources management. Accounting is a field of business that records and reports the flow of funds through a firm on a historical basis, and produces important financial statements such as balance sheets and income statements. It also produces forecasts of future conditions, such as projected financial statements and financial budgets, and evaluates the firm's financial performance against the forecasts.
The finance area of business supports a firm in decisions concerning the financing of the firm's business and the allocation and control of financial resources within the firm. Major activities of finance include cash and investment management, capital budgeting, financial forecasting, and financial planning. The cash and investment management activities forecast and manage the firm's cash position and short-term and other securities. The capital budgeting activity involves evaluating the profitability and risk of proposed capital expenditures. The financial planning process evaluates the present and projected financial performance of the firm and projects the firm's future financial needs. The marketing function of business is concerned with the planning, promotion, sale, and distribution of existing products or services in existing markets, and the development of new products and new services in order to better serve existing and potential customers with quality products and services. It is also responsible for customer relationship management, product planning, pricing, advertising, after-sales service, and market research and forecasting. The production operations function focuses on the management of all activities concerned with the planning and control of the process producing goods or services. These activities include purchasing of raw material and parts, product design, inventory, manufacturing processes, facilities, location, and layout, quality control, and such other logistics as distribution and transportation. The human resource management function involves the recruitment, placement, evaluation, compensation, and development of a firm's employees, with the main goal of the effective and efficient use of a firm's human capital. The human resources management function supports planning to meet the personal needs of the business development of employees to their full potential. And control of all personnel policies and programs. While each of the aforementioned functional areas within a firm used to operate somewhat independently with its own objectives and resources, information and other computer technologies have integrated all business functions within the firm and created something called an internet worked e-business enterprise. Strategic uses of information technology. What is information technology? How can information technology be used in an organization to improve its efficiency? How much investment should an organization make in information technology? What are the business benefits and opportunities an organization may achieve from using information technology? These are some of the most important questions many organizations ask themselves before investing their capitals in information technology. In an academic term, information technology is defined as hardware. Software, telecommunications, database management, and other information processing technologies used in computer-based information systems. There are many ways that organizations may view and use information technology. However, in today's competitive business environment, technology is no longer an afterthought in forming business strategy, but it is the actual cause and driver. In other words, for a firm to maintain or improve its business competitiveness, it must use information technology to achieve strategic advantage. Information technology can help a company substantially reduce the cost of business processes and lower the costs of customers or suppliers. Information technology can help a company differentiate its products and services from others. Using information technology, a firm can create new products and services or make radical changes to business processes. A firm can use information technology to manage regional and global business expansion, or to diversify and integrate into other products and services. 
A firm can use information technology to create virtual organizations of business partners, or to develop alliances with customers, suppliers, and other business partners. Information technology can dramatically improve the efficiency of business processes and the quality of products and services. Using information technology, a firm can build a strategic information base of all the information collected. Some experts argue that use of information technology has become a strategic necessity. Rather than a strategic advantage, because most competitive advantages don't last more than a few years. Whether the statement is true or not, most companies may not want to wait too long before investing in information technology, because it would be tough to catch up later once you get behind your competitors, especially when everyone is playing with newer, better technology. E-commerce, electronic commerce, or simply e-commerce, is more than just buying and selling products or services online. It encompasses the entire online process of developing, marketing, selling, delivering, servicing, and paying for products and services. E-commerce systems rely on the resources of the internet and other computer networks to support every step of the process. Through an e-commerce system, customers can order and make payment for the products or services they purchase online, and receive support at the company's websites through the internet. It also allows customers and suppliers to participate in product development via internet news groups and email exchanges. There are three basic types of e-commerce applications: business to business (B to B), business to consumer (B to C), and consumer to consumer (C to C). Business to business B to B e-commerce is the online automation of purchase and sale transactions from business to business. Many companies use secure internet or extranets for their business customers and suppliers to access to their websites, while some may rely on electronic data interchange (EDI) systems. Cisco Systems, a leading manufacturer of computer networking equipment, makes about 40 percent of its sales online. These activities include order taking, credit check. Production scheduling and technical support to their customers. General Electric and the United Parcel Service (UPS) are a few of many other firms that offer B to B e-commerce sites. Business to consumer (B to C) e-commerce creates electronic marketplaces where businesses promote and sell products and services directly to consumers. In this form of electronic commerce, which has grown into a multi-billion-dollar market, businesses can bypass intermediaries such as distributors or retail outlets. Companies like Amazon.com and Dell Corporation offer e-commerce websites that provide virtual storefronts and multimedia catalogs, interactive order processing, secure electronic payment systems, and online customer support. Consumer to consumer C to C e-commerce is an important alternative for business to business or business to consumer e-commerce. In this form of e-commerce, consumers can buy and sell products and services with each other in an auction process at an auction website. Through an online auction site like eBay, one of the most successful C to C e-commerce models, consumers or businesses can participate in or sponsor consumer or business auctions. Other forms of consumer to consumer e-commerce include personal advertising of products or services by consumers at electronic newspaper sites, consumer e-commerce portals, or personal websites. The first five years of my life in Canada.
I left Korea 25 years ago for Toronto, Ontario, Canada. I was 17 years old at that time. Now everyone knows how old I am. As any immigrant who left his or her own country for a new place looking for a better life, I believe the first five years of my living in Canada were the most challenging ones. It did not take a long time for me to realize that I would have to face one of the biggest challenges in my life, the language problem. Although I had learned English in high school for almost five years before coming to Canada, I did not find it useful in day-to-day -day living at this new place. My frustrations stemming from lack of my English conversation skills included ordering food at a fast food restaurant, phone conversation, and conversations with neighbors. The most frustrating moment was my inability to explain to other people when I was accused of something I did not do. Knowing that I was not able to defend myself properly due to lack of conversation skills, a few people often took advantage of me for their own benefits. However, throughout the years, I met a lot of good people who gave me strength and encouragement. Among those people in my heart, I still remember Mrs. Overholtz. Mrs. Overholtz was working in the counselor's office at the high school I attended for two years, and she gave me a lot of valued advice and direction in regards to my academic life as well as my personal one. My dear friends in my high school also helped me, not only to survive in the new country, but also taught me the new cultures and systems. Some of them went to the same university as I did, while others went to different institutions. I am still in contact with many of them, but wherever they are, I believe they are making a positive contribution to the society. I owe the most to my father. My mother, who passed away seven years ago, and my brothers. We were neither rich nor poor, but we stuck together all the time. My parents taught me love, care, and kindness through their actions, not just their words. It was from my family that I got strength when I was weak. It was my family who listened to me when I needed to talk. It was my family who really was happy for me when I told them good news. The first five years of my life in Canada surely was one of the most difficult times in my life. I believe, however, that it was also an important time in my life for me to become a more mature and independent human being. I thank all of those who played a role in some way to help me out during the transition period of my life. Great Lakes The Great Lakes are a group of five large freshwater lakes in North America that are interconnected by natural and artificial channels. They are, from east to west, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Huron, Lake Michigan, and Lake Superior. Most of them, except Lake Michigan, which lies entirely within the United States, form part of the border between the United States and Canada. The Great Lakes are bordered by the Canadian province of Ontario and by eight U.S. states, including from west to east, Wisconsin, Minnesota, Illinois, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and New York. Large cities like Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Toronto lie on the shores of the Great Lakes system. The Great Lakes system, with a combined surface area of 244,100 square kilometers, holds about 20% of the world's fresh surface water. Lake elevations decrease to the east and south. Lake Superior, the largest lake, at 82,100 square kilometers, is also the largest freshwater lake in the world. Its outlet is the St. Mary's River, which enters Lake Huron after falling about seven meters over a series of rapids. Lake Huron and Lake Michigan lie at the same elevation. Water flows from Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. Lake Michigan is deeper than Lake Huron, but the latter is larger in area, 
at 59,600 square kilometers. Lake Huron drains into the St. Clair River, which falls about three meters between Lake Huron and the small, shallow basin of Lake St. Clair. Lake St. Clair is connected to Lake Erie by the Detroit River. At its northeast end, Lake Erie empties into the Niagara River, which drops 99 meters as it flows north to Lake Ontario, which is the smallest of the Great Lakes, at 19,010 square kilometers. Lake Ontario is linked with the Atlantic Ocean via the St. Lawrence River. The Great Lakes, interconnected by rivers, straits, and canals, are a natural resource of tremendous significance in North America. They serve as the focus of the industrial heartland of the continent, and together form one of the world's busiest shipping arteries. The lakes also form an important recreational resource, with about 17,000 kilometers of shoreline, rich sport fisheries, and numerous beaches and marinas. Canadian Rocky Mountains Some of the best-known mountain scenery on Earth is concentrated in a set of seven parks in the Canadian Rocky Mountains. There are four national parks in the Canadian Rockies, Banff, Jasper, Yoho, and Kootenay, and three British Columbia provincial parks, Mount Robson, Mount Assiniboine, and Hamber. The seven preserves located along the Alberta-British Columbia border attract more than nine million people annually. Banff National Park became Canada's first national park in 1885 and the birthplace of Canada's national park system. It is home to a variety of distinctive natural features and cultural and historical sites. Rugged mountains, glaciers, ice fields, alpine meadows, beautiful blue cold water lakes, mineral hot springs, deep canyons, and hoodoos compose the natural landscape and habitat for a great variety of mammals such as elk, bighorn sheep, black and grizzly bear, and caribou. Jasper National Park is the largest and most northerly of the Canadian Rocky Mountain parks. The park is less commercialized than Banff, so it can still keep many natural beauties and scenery. Its scenery includes deeply gouged Malign Canyon, picturesque Malign Lake, the thunder of Sunwapta Falls, the serene beauty of glacier-covered Mount Edith Cavell, and Miette Hot Springs. As one of 39 national parks in Canada, Kootenay National Park represents the southwestern slopes of the Canadian Rocky Mountains. From glacier-clad peaks to semi-arid grasslands, where even cactus grows, Kootenay is rich in variety and is one of the largest protected areas in the world. Yoho National Park, representing the western slopes of the Rocky Mountains region, holds the secrets of ancient ocean life, the power of ice and water, and unique plant and animal communities that continue to evolve today. Awe and wonder is a natural response for this place of rock walls, spectacular waterfalls, and soaring peaks. The Burgess Shale contains one of the world's most significant finds of soft-bodied, middle Cambrian age marine fossils, with about 150 species, including some bearing no resemblance to known animals. These four Canadian national parks account for 14,300 square miles. The four national parks, along with the three British Columbia Provincial Parks, form the UNESCO Rocky Mountain Parks World Heritage Site, one of the largest protected areas in the world. For the record, what is the world's tallest mountain and highest elevation? Of course, Mount Everest, on the border of Nepal and Tibet, China, is the world's tallest mountain and highest elevation with a peak at 29,035 feet, or 8,850 meters. The National Geographic Society revised the height of Mount Everest in 1999 from 29,028 feet, or 8,848 meters, due to new GPS calculations. What is the world's tallest mountain from base to peak? Mauna Kea in Hawaii is the one 
Its base is on the sea floor and rises 33,480 feet, or 10,314 meters in total, reaching 13,796 feet, or 4,205 meters above sea level. In reference to its towering height of 20,320 feet above sea level, Mount McKinley in Alaska is the tallest mountain in North America. It has been named the Roof of North America or the Chimney of North America. Located about 55 kilometers drive from Amman, Jordan, the Dead Sea in the Middle East region is the lowest point on Earth. The sunset touching distant hills with ribbons of fire across the waters of the Dead Sea brings a sense of unreality to culminate a day's visit to the lowest point on Earth, some 1,320 feet or 400 meters below sea level. En route, a stone marker indicates sea level, but the Dead Sea itself is not reached before descending another 400 meters below this sign. As the name suggests, the sea is devoid of life due to an extremely high content of salts and minerals. But it is these natural elements which give the waters their curative powers, recognized since the days of Herod the Great, more than two thousand years ago. They also provide the raw materials for the renowned Jordanian Dead Sea bath salts and cosmetic products which are marketed worldwide. Badwater Basin, the floor of Death Valley National Park in California, is the lowest point in the Western Hemisphere, with 282 feet or 85 meters below sea level. Death Valley National Park, established in 1933, has more than 3.3 million acres of spectacular desert scenery, interesting and rare desert wildlife, complex geology, undisturbed wilderness, and sites of historical and cultural interest. Canadian Universities. There are about 50 standing alone four-year degree granting universities in Canada. Unlike the higher education system in the United States, most of the universities in Canada are publicly funded institutions, although there are a few private institutions. These public universities are funded and regulated by the province to which they belong. In British Columbia, there are four publicly funded universities: University of British Columbia. Simon Fraser University, University of Victoria, and University of Northern British Columbia, and one private university, Trinity Western University. In Alberta, the three publicly funded universities are University of Alberta, University of Calgary, and University of Lethbridge. In Saskatchewan, the two publicly funded universities are University of Saskatchewan and University of Regina. Moving into Manitoba, there are three publicly funded universities in the province. They are University of Manitoba, University of Winnipeg, and Brandon University. Ontario is not only the most populated province in Canada, but also has the largest number of universities. It has 17 publicly funded universities. They are, from west to east and south to north, University of Windsor. University of Western Ontario, University of Guelph, University of Waterloo, Wilfrid Laurier University, McMaster University, Brock University, York University, University of Toronto, Ryerson University, Trent University, Queens University, University of Ottawa, Carleton University, Laurentian University, Nipissing University. And Lakehead University, the province of Quebec has seven publicly funded universities, with many of them having several branch campuses throughout the province. They are University of Montreal, University of Quebec, Laval University, Concordia University, McGill University, University of Sherbrooke, and Bishop's University. While French is the official language of instruction at most of these institutions, English is the official one at both Concordia University and McGill University. Canada's Atlantic provinces have the rest of the 50 universities in Canada. 
They are University of New Brunswick and University of Moncton in the province of New Brunswick, Acadia University, Dalhousie University, Mount Allison University, Mount St. Vincent University, St. Mary's University, and Nova Scotia Agricultural College in the province of Nova Scotia. University of Prince Edward Island in the province of Prince Edward Island, and University of Newfoundland in the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Banff National Park. Banff National Park is Canada's oldest and most famous national park. It was founded in 1885 after the discovery of the cave and basin hot springs. From humble beginnings as a 26 square kilometer hot springs reserve, Banff National Park now consists of 6,641 square kilometers of unparalleled mountain scenery, nestled in the heart of the magnificent Canadian Rockies. Each year, millions of visitors come to Banff to marvel at the emerald waters of Lake Louise, walk amongst the flower-filled heavens at Sunshine Meadows, and drive beneath the towering jagged peaks lining the ice fields parkway between Banff and Jasper. Ten thousand years ago, natives camped on the shores of the Vermilion Lakes beneath the wind-swept peak of Mount Rundle. They were the only people here to enjoy the mountain landscape, the beautiful sunrises, and the hot springs. Nearly ten millennia later, a struggling nation forged a crazy dream of connecting itself from sea to sea with steel rails, and from this railway venture was born Canada's most famous park, Banff National Park. Banff National Park contains some of the most spectacular mountain scenery in the world. Snow-capped peaks, glistening glaciers, ice fields, alpine meadows, blue, cold, crystal-clear lakes, raging rivers, mineral hot springs, deep canyons, hoodoos, and sweeping vistas are just one part of the allure of Banff National Park. The park is also the home of some of North America's wildest creatures, including black and grizzly bears, caribou, and wolves. Banff and Lake Louise are two major towns in Banff National Park. As the largest town in the park, Banff is Canada's highest town at 1,384 meters, 4,540 feet above sea level. Lake Louise, with its blue-green water set against the stark backdrop of Victoria Glacier, is the highest permanent settlement in Canada, at 1,536 meters, 5,039 feet above the sea level, and probably the most beloved and most photographed scene in the Canadian Rockies. In Banff National Park, driving through the Bow Valley Parkway, one of the world's most scenic highways, is a good opportunity to see animals, particularly deer, bears, and moose. Banff National Park is part of the UNESCO Rocky Mountain Parks World Heritage Site. Sport Canada. Sport Canada is the name of Canada's federal government program to help support athletes. The purpose of Sport Canada is to develop and encourage sport, health, and exercise programs for all Canadians. However, Sport Canada's main emphasis is on high-performance athletes training for major international athletic competitions, such as the Olympic Games. Sport Canada was created in the 1970s as a response to the perceived need to help athletes train and compete in international sport. Before the 1970s, athletes wishing to train and compete in sport had to support themselves financially. Athletes were either independently wealthy or were supported by family or friends. Unfortunately, many high-caliber athletes without such financial support simply could not afford to train and compete in international competition. Also, before the early 1970s, almost all international sports events were amateur. Amateur rules meant those receiving funds from government programs or corporations were breaking the rules of sport. Athletes receiving money were disqualified from competition. As a result, the amateur rules generally limited training and competition to those athletes who came from wealthier families. Less fortunate athletes, many of whom likely would have performed well for Canada in international competitions, simply could not afford to do so.
Sport Canada has been a role model for many government-run sport programs around the world. With its central administrative offices in Canada's capital of Ottawa, Sport Canada efficiently provides administrative, coaching, and financial help for athletes across the country. Athletes can concentrate their efforts full time on training and competition. As a result, Canada's share of the medal totals in the Olympic Games has risen since the 1970s. Recently, Sport Canada's programs have been criticized by some who feel that the program does not provide enough money for athletes. While it does provide financial assistance to athletes, the amount paid is well below Canada's minimum wage. Critics point out that athletes work full time and perform an important function for the Canadian government and people. As a result of this criticism, the Canadian government has provided more money for athletes. However, the amount is still below the minimum wage level. As a result, the amount paid to athletes is likely to rise in the future. As long as it effectively manages problems such as funding, Sport Canada will continue to provide the Canadian public with international caliber athletes who compete with the very best in the world. The National Hockey League. The National Hockey League, or NHL, is the largest and most successful North American professional hockey league. The NHL provides Canadians and Americans with the highest caliber and most entertaining hockey on the continent. The NHL was created in 1917 by a group of Canadian and American businessmen. Their two central goals were to create a league that provided the most entertaining hockey in North America, and generated revenues and profits. This was a somewhat new idea at the time. While there were some for-profit leagues in existence, most were amateur. This meant that players, coaches, and owners of teams were not allowed to make money from playing the game of hockey. It took several decades for the NHL to become the most dominant league. In the early days, a few professional or commercial leagues competed with the NHL for the public's entertainment dollar. Leagues competed vigorously for the best players in order to be successful and attract spectators and fans. While this was beneficial to players because they could command higher salaries, it was bad for business because owners' expenses skyrocketed. As a result, many teams and leagues went bankrupt. By the 1930s, however, the NHL remained as the only major professional league in North America. This effectively kept players' salaries down and reduced expenses. The NHL's team owners realized that in order for the league to be a successful commercial business, they would have to stop competing against each other off the ice. This was best accomplished by ensuring that only one major league existed, so that competition was reduced. To this day, the same business model is followed, and the NHL is still the only major professional hockey league in North America. For several decades in the mid 20th century, the NHL owners were extremely successful financially. They generated very high profits because, having a monopoly in the hockey market, they could limit the sale and trade of players. When players signed onto a team, they generally did so for life and at the pay rate determined by the owner. Players were forced to accept these conditions because there were no other leagues in existence. This all changed in the 1970s when players organized to form a players' union. Through the collective bargaining process, players gradually fought owners for higher pay and greater rights. Today, many players are very wealthy for this reason. If it was not for the players' union, it is likely they would still be working in similar conditions to those during the early days of the NHL: low pay and little freedom to move from team to team. With NHL owners and players cooperating, the NHL continues to be the most successful and entertaining hockey league in North America. Teams across Canada and the United States compete for the prized Stanley Cup, the most sought-after trophy in North American hockey. Drug use in sport. Athletes using drugs to enhance performance has become one of the greatest problems facing elite international sport. 
Major sports organizations, such as the International Olympic Committee, are putting a lot of time, effort, and money into the detection of drugs. The race between athletes using drugs and detection agencies seems to be just as fierce as sport competition itself. Athletes have been using drugs or other stimulants to enhance performance for centuries. Even athletes in the ancient Olympic Games in Greece used various stimulants to enhance performance. However, since the 1950s, the degree of drug use has risen to a level never before seen in human athletic history. Drug testing began in the Olympic Games in the 1960s. One of the first sports to encounter drug use was cycling. During the 1960 Summer Olympic Games in Rome, Italy, a cyclist died from an amphetamine use. In 1967, another cyclist died in the Tour de France cycling race. Around the same period, bodybuilders in the United States were experimenting with newly developed synthetic steroids that built muscle mass. As a result, the International Olympic Committee started testing for steroids during the 1976 Olympic Games in Montreal, Canada. Probably the most famous case of an athlete using drugs was Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson. After winning the 100 meter sprint in the 1988 Summer Olympic Games in Seoul, South Korea, Johnson's drug test was found to be positive. Johnson took a synthetic steroid to build muscle mass and enhance power. Eventually, Johnson was stripped of his gold medal. In the aftermath of Johnson's positive drug test, the Canadian government conducted a federal inquiry into the drug use in Canadian sport. The government inquiry was the largest one to have been conducted in any country up to that point in time. The results of the inquiry found that drug use among Canadian athletes was very common. The inquiry stated that there were problems beyond just individual athletes, such as Johnson taking drugs to enhance performance. Indeed, it was stated that there was a moral crisis throughout sport. Today, the race between drug detection agencies and athletes who use drugs continues. In January 2000, the International Olympic Committee created a new agency to detect drug use the World Anti Doping Agency, WADA. WADA has provided increased resources for drug detection, especially in Olympic sports. Hopefully, WADA will be able to keep pace with the current moral crisis in sport.